Today, Bitcoin rises back to the $64,000 mark to end the week. A New York jury convicts a crypto trader in the Justice Department's first ever cryptocurrency market manipulation case. And in the final hours before the halving, we explore why this time is different from those in the past. Welcome to CNBC's Crypto World, I'm Jordan Smith. Digital currencies are making a run higher to close out the week as we enter the final hours before the Bitcoin halving. By noon Eastern, Bitcoin jumped back above $64,000, a gain of about 1.5%. Ether traded a little under $3,100, and Solana rose to $146. Things have been a little unsteady for Bitcoin in this final run-up to the halving. The cryptocurrency fell as low as the $59,000 level in recent days as the economic and geopolitical pressures are mounting. Today's gains weren't enough to push Bitcoin higher for the week, though. It's fallen more than 3% in the past seven days, and Ether, it's dropped more than 4% in that same time. As Bitcoin moved lower this week, the spot Bitcoin ETFs also felt the pressure. Coindesk reports that outflows for the ETFs reached $4.3 million on Thursday, adding to a four-day streak of withdrawals. The question will be how markets respond post-halving. We'll talk more about that in just a bit. All right, let's talk about the top stories. Matt Hogan, Bitwise Asset Management's CIO, joined Squawk Box this morning to discuss markets and whether Bitcoin can be considered a store of value or safe haven asset, especially amid rising tensions in the Middle East. This morning, Israel launched retaliatory strikes against Iran. Crypto prices were first impacted by Iran's unprecedented drone strike against Israel last Saturday. That's when Bitcoin was hovering around $70,000. The next day, the cryptocurrency hit a low of $60,985 according to coin metrics, but later rebounded a bit and remained volatile for the rest of the week. There are a lot of cross currents in Bitcoin's price right now. There's ETF demand, there's the halving, there's tax related selling, and of course there's these geopolitical events. I think you can try to read too much into the short term trading activity. It's better to pan out. If you look big picture, it's done a great job of protecting us against inflation post COVID. I think eventually it will be a good hedge against geopolitical uh, disruptions, but it's a bit too much to ask for Bitcoin to both be a perfect risk off asset and deliver exponential returns. It's an emerging risk off asset when it gets to be fully mature and is a perfect hedge for the events like we saw in Iran and Israel over the past week or so those exponential returns will be gone. So I think you have to keep that big picture in mind. Bitcoin is still growing into what it will eventually be. Next, a New York federal jury convicted a crypto trader in what the DOJ calls a multi-million dollar scheme that was the department's first ever crypto open market manipulation case. Prosecutors said 28-year-old Abraham Eisenberg fraudulently obtained about $110 million worth of crypto from the Mango Markets Exchange and its customers by artificially driving up the price of both futures contracts and the Mango token. He then borrowed crypto based on the value of the inflated assets without planning on paying it back. Eisenberg, who was living in Puerto Rico, now faces a maximum possible sentence of 20 years behind bars for wire and commodities fraud, as well as commodities manipulation charges. He's scheduled to be sentenced in Manhattan Federal Court in July. Last, the SEC argues that Justin Sun traveled to the U.S. extensively during the time that his tokens were promoted, offered, and sold, which gives sway to the agency's lawsuit against the Tron founder and his company. The SEC made that argument in this court filing yesterday, responding to Sun's request a few weeks ago to dismiss the lawsuit. In the request for dismissal, the defendants argued that the SEC lacked the jurisdiction, a claim that Sun made when he was on our show back in May. In the filing, the defendants said that the SEC's case stretches beyond the regulator's scope and that extending the U.S. securities laws to cover predominantly foreign conduct go too far and should be rejected. However, the SEC argues that the court has personal jurisdiction over the defendants because they, quote, purposefully took actions in and directed toward the United States by doing things like promoting TRX and BTT tokens to U.S. investors. The SEC sued Sun, Tron, BitTorrent Foundation, and Rainberry in March of last year, alleging the groups offered and promoted unregistered securities, along with committing fraud and market manipulation. We reached out to Justin Sun's team for comment, but didn't hear back right away. All right, for our main story, the Bitcoin halving is just a few hours away. Countdown on NiceHash estimates that it should happen sometime between tonight and tomorrow. So what exactly is this much anticipated event? Well, Bitcoin miners get paid in Bitcoin to validate transactions, and every four years that reward is halved. Historically, the halving's cut to supply has led to significant rallies for Bitcoin, but with prices rallying so much in the run-up to the halving event this year, things look a lot different. So some say to expect a huge rally, while others like JP Morgan analysts say the price could go down right after the event. 
Crypto World's Tanea McKeel explores why the halving is so uncertain for markets this year. 2024's Bitcoin halving is getting a lot of attention. The technical event that cuts the reward paid out to miners happens roughly every four years. In the past, it was only celebrated by a few of the cryptocurrency's biggest cheerleaders. This year, though, the halving is a hot topic. Sometime in the next 12, 18 months, you know, Bitcoin can be over 150,000. Around the happening, where the, the amount of Bitcoin coming to market is cut in half. After that time period, you see another year of a bull market. And the reason for all the attention? There are way more people who care about and invest in Bitcoin than there were in 2020 during the last halving. That's thanks to a wave of adoption during the last cycle and new investment options for crypto curious investors like spot ETFs. This was the defining moment, I think, of Bitcoin, at least, right, in in this era of its history. Like, this was its kind of um, IPO-like moment. Pandora's box is now open for institutional adoption of the asset class. Investors are excited because the halving has historically set the stage for Bitcoin's next bull cycle. The event cuts the number of new Bitcoin entering the network each day, and that means tighter supply. Bitcoin now has a clear uh, demand on a very scarce asset, and that asset is about to get even more scarce with Bitcoin halving. That added scarcity often kickstarts Bitcoin's rally to new all-time highs. Looking back at the 2012, 2016, and 2020 halvings, Bitcoin's price ran up about 93 times, 30 times, and 8 times, respectively, from its halving day price to its cycle top. Of course, past performance isn't indicative of future results, and the market is very different this time around. Huge maturation of the asset class, infrastructure development, more people than ever being interested in it. Investors are hoping that this halving event will also lead to big gains, but others think that those golden days of the halving supercharging the market might be behind us. Julio Moreno of CryptoQuant called the halving a once significant event. So with all the hype and debate, what should you expect for Bitcoin's price in the near term? So immediately after, if we're going to define that as like 24 hours, 48 hours, a week, like really short term, I don't expect you're going to see much at all. It's not a short term phenomenon. This is a $30 million a day reduction in sell pressure. That effect builds over time. So while that will have an effect on the market, one day, two days, three days, four days after, I don't think you're going to see a whole lot and in the long term, well, if you noticed earlier, each halving event has provided diminishing returns. 2012 saw a bigger rally than 2016, and so on. There are also more ways than ever for investors to push Bitcoin's price higher. I'll come out and say I am a, a skeptic on the fact that the diminishing returns will happen this year. I think this year we see a greater return than last cycle. Because, you know, ultimately what drives an asset price up, any asset price, is not financial models, it's not cash flows, it's people hitting the buy button in their brokerage account. I think it's a little bit of a self-fulfilling prophecy where certainly, you know, a reduction in issuance of Bitcoin does help the uh, price by making it more scarce. But a large part of it is also just bringing it back into headlines, having it be top of mind. You know, in practice, the ETF flows are substantially larger than any sort of uh, increased issuance in, in Bitcoin from Bitcoin miners. So I think it's not a more of a material change and more of just a change in, in perception uh, of the asset. All right, that's all for Crypto World this week. We'll be back again on Monday and we'll see you then.